So when I turned probably 60, I began to think. I didn't think a lot before that. <laughs> I was 60, and I thought, wow, I got here fast. And so I began to think about the future, future of the church, my future, my wife's future, and just, you know, what's healthy, what's good. Now I began to pray. I began to talk to some of my mentors, fellow pastors who I, you know, uh, had spoken into my life over the years, guys who I consider spiritual as well as wise, and began to talk about a new season. And probably two or three years ago, I began to visit some churches and that had, you know, changed pastors and sat down with some of them and uh, called a young guy that I had sent over in ministry into Europe and asked him to travel with me to Israel one year and thought maybe, hey, this might be the guy. We spent time together and uh, took him to Israel with me. He taught and just came to the place where I realized, no, he's not the guy to step into the pulpit or be the leader. And, and, I, and I began to continue to pray and ask my son, Neil, would he be interested in coming back? And at that time, he said no. And, and long story short, about a year or more, Neil came back, my oldest son, and uh, we began this transition process of a new season of ministry here at Coastline. And I'm not retiring, I'm not, um, you know, moving up to the mountains and growing a big beard or anything like that. I can't even grow a beard, so, uh, but I am going to enter into a new season here where uh, Neil, uh, who's been here over a year and a half now, we've met with the board, and he's going to become the lead pastor of the church. I'll be... Uh, the founding pastor who coaches from the side. I'm not really going anywhere. I'll be teaching every other week. And I've kind of given him the staff about a year ago, and he began to, to, to work with them and organize them in the way he wants to and, and take some new directions. And, and one thing I told him, I said, you know, here's what I would love to see happen. I would love to see all the complaints come to you <laughs> And all the good stories come to me. Let's, let's try to work it out that way. So, so I decided today I want to share a message. And next Sunday, uh, he and I are going to kind of co-share. He's in Destin actually helping out down there this, this weekend. But, you know, my wife and I uh, took a step of faith in 1983 and uh, planted a church. There was nothing I ever really wanted to do. Honestly, I had gone to Bible college for four years, uh, Assemblies of God. I met my wife, Lynn, there. Uh, we grad I graduated, and, and uh, we got married. Nine months later, we packed up a, a U-Haul and moved to Kansas City, Missouri, so I could go to seminary, and she finished her college degree up, out there in Kansas City. And we moved back, and, and two years later, we started the church. And I'd never heard of Calvary Chapels. I never intended to plant a church. And someone told me about Calvary Chapels, and I went out to San Diego. I met a guy, and I, I said, you know, I don't fit in the assemblies. I don't really fit in the Baptist mold. I just don't know what to do. I've gone through seven years of, you know, this training and all this stuff. And he, he listened to my story. And he said, well, here's what I think you ought to do. And I mean, I was just all ears, all eyes, wanting to do what God's called me to do. Felt like I had gone through the, some preparation. And he said, go back to your hometown, rent some place, and begin teaching the Bible. And I thought, that's it? <laughs> he goes, yeah, that's it. So I came home, I told my wife that. And she, she was like, really? So we rented the cafeteria and classrooms up here at Oriel Beach Elementary School. I'll never forget the first service. It was the last Sunday of October, 1983. And they had had a huge Halloween fest there in the cafeteria. And so we had set the whole things up and they had had the doors and everything open for all of this food and stuff. And 
there were still flies in the room, even though the air was on. And, and I was standing at this little bitty platform and hanging from the ceiling were skeletons and witches <laughs> and ghosts. There was like a witch hanging over me, you know. And, and I thought, this is not a good start. This is not how we should be starting this thing. And I told Lynn, I said, Lynn, I will do this for a year. And if the Lord doesn't provide, if, if this doesn't, you know, take root, if it's not something that God's blessing, then I'll do something else. I don't have to be a pastor. I'm not going to work for a job so I can teach on the weekend. I said, if God's in it, we'll know it. If he's not, then I'll do something else. Well, after about a year, the school told me, you only get two years in the building. I said, after two years, you got to move out. you got to find another place. So I started looking. Started looking for property, started looking for a building. So, we, you know, we're going to have to do something in two years because after the first year, the Lord was blessing it. People were coming. The cafeteria was filling up. There was kids. You know, all the dynamics of what do you do now? And so myself, another very close friend of mine named Chris Zinn, and another guy, we, we found this piece of property here. And it was just all pine trees. The road ended right there at the end of Harrison. There was no main road from the, you know, Oriole Beach Road. It was just this piece of property back here. And uh, we came down here and we looked at it. A friend of mine had told me about it. And we walked around on it. And we knelt down on the corner where the first building is as you come into Harrison. And we knelt down there on that corner and we just began to pray. And we were praying and finally, my friend Chris said, he stopped and he said, I felt like the Lord spoke to me. And we, we, we looked at him and said, well, what did he say? <laughs> he said, I believe God wants to make this a beachhead for souls. And we said, we agree. And so we began to pursue a building. We built the first building and before that building could even get up off the ground, the foundation was laid. My good friend Chris uh, got cancer. He had four kids. He was 30 years old. And um, I'd go visit him in the hospital. I had a mobile home here on here. Not that I was living in, but I was using it as an office, kind of overseeing what was going on. We'd meet every morning and pray for him. And I just thought, God, you're going to heal him. This is going to be this awesome thing. And it's just going to be this major deal you're going to do to kick off the church. And he died. And it was the first funeral I'd ever done in my whole life. And, and, and out of that experience, I, I kind of learned that, that God takes you through the good, through the bad, through the, through the hurts, through the victories. But you just trust him in the midst of it. And so the church began. And 37 years later, it's just been an amazing, uh, you know, roller coaster of all kinds of people getting saved and churches and missionaries and pastors and uh, just an amazing journey for Lynn and I. And today I want to share a, a, a sermon, a, a message, if you will, that I think is significant about how a person starts their faith and continues their faith and allows God to use their faith in their life. So Colossians chapter 2, I would begin with this verse, verse 6, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Rooted, built up in him, established in the faith, as you've been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. When I, when I came to Christ around 17 or 18, I was about as lost as you could be. Growing up in the 60s and the 70s, following an older brother who was three years older than me into the surfing culture, all kinds of stuff there in the 70s and 60s, drugs, sex, music was starting to change, and I was right in the midst of it. Long hair, dropped out of high school at 16, and just began to travel with my brother, very immersed into surfing. And then around 18, 19, 
I got radically saved. The Jesus movement was coming through the country, around the world, and the Lord got a hold of my heart. Not without a battle. I had all these things in life that I was doing and, and that I knew were wrong, and, 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 and there was this, if you've, you've probably been there, where there was this conviction of the Holy Spirit. There was this battle going on within me to give up my old life, my old ways, and, and to surrender to the Lord. And boy, I struggled and struggled. And I remember finally coming to the place, saying to the Lord, well, Lord, if you can do something with my life, if you can change me, then I'm all in. And I surrendered my life to the Lord. And there came this enormous release of guilt, this enormous release of shame and, and this burden of, of needing to be forgiven. It's almost like, you know how it feels like when you've been on a long trip and you finally come home? It was like that. It's like, oh, I'm home. If anyone be in Christ, you know, he's a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. And I knew I was saved. There's no doubt in my mind. I, I started going to church, and, and here's the deal. I liked it. <laughs> I knew something's wrong with you, John. You're liking church. And I wanted to be there every time the door was open. And I'd go to all the Bible studies I could. And so I had arrived at this destination. I thought, well, I'm finally here. I'm free. I'm saved. I'm, you know, I've got a relationship with God. It's real. But I realized that the journey had just begun. Coming to Christ is like just pulling up in the driveway. There's so much that lies ahead. And I think this passage of Scripture is very apropos to tell that story for me and us as a church. You receive Christ. You're saved. And this is what it says. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. Now, let me be very clear. You do not receive a message. You might hear one. You do not receive a new philosophy of life where now, okay, I'm going to think this way instead of thinking that way. You don't rearrange your furniture feng shui and now I'm a different person, right? No, that's not what you receive. It's not a new list of rules or holidays that you keep. It's not, okay, I'll start going to church now and be a good person. It's not a spiritual experience. You receive Christ Jesus the Lord. That's what it is. You enter into a relationship. You receive Christ. And these three words are, are very significant, the way they're listed and what they mean in the Greek. Christ. That's the first word that's used here. It's, it's not a name. It's a title. You receive Christ. Who he is. You know, my name is uh, John Stephen Spencer. I, I got my first name, I believe, from my grandfather on my mother's side. Jesus' name is not Christ. It's a title. It's a title that's given to him, and, and it means anointed one, or anointed, or chosen. That's who he is. The, the, the equivalent in the Hebrew is the word Messiah. It also means anointed, anointed one, or chosen. Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one, the chosen one. And, and in the Old Testament, there's three types of people who were chosen and anointed. There was the kings. There were the priests, and there were the prophets. And Jesus is the only one who ever fulfilled all three of these callings. He's our king, he's our great prophet, and he's our high priest who can be touched with our infirmities. The true king of kings, the mighty prophet in word and deed, and our great high priest, all in one, chosen and anointed by God the Father. And that's who you enter into a relationship with. And, and please listen, don't misunderstand this. Uh, there's a lot of ways, and if you're a Christian here, 
There's a lot of different stories about how you come to Jesus. Uh, someone gave me a track, and then someone gave me a Bible, and then I went to church, and, and that was a process that began. Some of you, a friend might have shared with you, or you heard a radio station message, or someone gave you a Bible, or, or a song, or maybe even a dream. A lot of different ways to hear and respond. But Jesus Christ, the Lord, He is the only way to salvation. In, in, the, in the passage in 1 Timothy chapter 2, it says, For this is a good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. He's the way. He's the truth. And He is the life. So, so you come by Him. And today, if you're not sure of your salvation, you can be. You might be sitting here today, and if I were to say to you, hey, do you know for sure you're saved? Do you know for sure if you died, you'd go to heaven? You might be sitting there, and you might be thinking, well, I hope so. I think I am. I'm pretty sure. Well, you can know for sure. It's like being married. If I asked you, are you married, would you say, I hope so. <laughs> I think I am. I've got a ring. No, you pretty much know you're married, right? It's not like you wake up in the morning and go, I wonder if I'm married. <laughs> oh, you know. <laughs> And, and you remember where it happened, when it happened, and how it happened. And I would submit to you that's pretty much true of being a Christian. You know, because something happens. God chose and sent Christ, the chosen one, the anointed one, the Messiah, to die on the cross for your sins, and you come to a place where you have to believe and receive him as your Messiah, your Christ. We have the word Jesus it's his human name. It's the name that the Son of God took when he came into the world. It's not a name like, like my name that my mom or dad chose because of my grandfather. It's not like Jesus was born and they said, hey, he looks like Uncle Jesus. Let's name him Uncle Jesus. Let's name him Jesus. No, you, you know the story. It's not given to him by Joe or Mary. In Matthew chapter 1, we, we know this, this has happened. Uh, Joseph is thinking about all these things. Mary's pregnant. What in the world's going on? And behold, an angel of the Lord appears to him in a dream, and he says, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid. To take to you, Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And then he says, she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, because his uncle's name is Jesus. No, for he will save his people from their sins. The name Jesus means Savior. So, so, so Christ Jesus, the name is, a, is of heavenly origin. It comes from the Lord himself. And he becomes our Savior once again by dying on the cross for our sins, yours and mine. One man, the chosen, the Savior. The anointed one gave his life, the, the just one, for the guilty. The one who was innocent for those who were, well, you know you're not innocent. He came as the anointed chosen Savior. And the, and the third title that's given to him here is the Lord. You know, the, the title Lord in the New Testament is a title given to Jesus and used for Jesus more than any other title in the entire New Testament. More than being called Jesus, more than being called Christ, more than being called Messiah, he's called Lord over and over and over again in the New Testament. We don't use that word much in our vocabulary today. We don't call people that. You know, you, you see uh, 
Darth Vader, he's called Lord, Lord Vader. But he's a, he's a dark Lord. We, we don't use that terminology. I mean, when I call my wife if I'm late or I'm coming home from work, she doesn't say, yes, John Stephen Spencer, my Lord. <laughs> she doesn't do this often. What would thou have us me fix you for dinner? I've tried to train her to do that. It's not working. My kids never said to me, my father, my Lord, may I, may I mow the lawn after I do my homework laundry and clean my room. Lord is a title. It's a title of authority, of power. It's a title of control. So, so look what it says in verse 6. This is so important for a Christian, for a church, for an individual to grab hold of. As you therefore have received, not a philosophy, not a bunch of rules, the anointed Savior, the one of authority, power, and control, now the journey begins and you walk in Him. This is your walk. Don't substitute it for anything else. Don't substitute it for a lifestyle that doesn't look like Him or demonstrate Him. Don't choose your plan versus His plan. Don't make up your own truth versus His truth. Walk in Him. He's the Christ. He's the Savior. He's, he's the Lord. Walk in Christ Jesus Christ. Our Lord. That's what it says. That's the call. That's the beginning of the journey after you walk through the door and get saved. We receive Him, and now the journey begins. What a journey it is. I mean, at 19, if you'd have told me, hey, okay, walk through the door. Okay, here I go. Read the Bible, read the Gospel of John. I got saved. Let's start this journey. If you'd have told me, John, you're going to plant a church, you're going to be involved around the country and the world and all kinds of stuff, you're going to have, you know, three kids and try to raise them upright, you're going to, you know, have 11 grandkids, I would have said, you're crazy. That's not in my background. There's never been a pastor in our family. You, you begin to walk in Him. And the journey begins, and, and, and Paul uses these two powerful metaphors when he says, and this is what it looks like, rooted and built up, rooted and built up. And you, you got this relationship that begins, and it's, it's a lifelong thing that's powerful. I mean, after, after Bible college and, and seminary, you know, I still feel like a kid on training wheels trying to figure out what this relationship really is and how powerful it is, how significant it is to, to not just me, but, but the impact in spite of yourself the Lord can have if you surrender, if you trust. I remember when it came time, we, we had gotten out of college and I had, uh, you know, finished four years of this degree and I, was, I thought, Lord, I'm ready, you know, thrust me into ministry, here I am, your gift to mankind. No doors opened. I got a job in a donut shop. I was frying donuts, grease splattering up on me. I said, Lord, this is not the type of fryer I was thinking of, you know, when you think of a biblical sense. It was crazy. Nine months later, a, f a good friend of mine who was one of my professors actually in Bible college called me up and said, what are you doing? I go, well, I'm working in a part-time in a little church, and I'm, and I'm working in a donut shop. I fry donuts six days a week. He goes, what? I go, yeah. Oh, they're good donuts, but, you know, it's not, not what I went to Bible college for. And I was still surfing as much as I possibly could. And there was this tension between my wife and I because here's, here's what would happen. I would get up at 2 or 3 in the morning, and I'd go to the donut store. There were just two guys that worked there, the guy who made the donuts and the guy who fried the donuts. 
and glazed the donuts and filled the donuts. I hate donuts. <laughs> then, unless now you can see I eat, eat donuts. So I'm doing this thing, and my brother is a surfer, owns surf shops. He surfs every day. He's making his living from surfing. But I went to Bible college. And I'm making donuts. So he would come by the, the shop every morning, and he lived here in Gulf Breeze. That's where the donut store was. And he'd be out there sipping his coffee, eating a donut, and I'd stick my head out. He'd wave and go, hey, the surf's three to four feet and glassy. i go, I'm making donuts. He goes, yeah, but you get off at noon, right? I go, yeah. He goes, well, I'll pick you up. We'll go surfing. And, and so here's the thing. If you get up at 2 in the morning and make donuts till noon, and then you surf from 12 to 5, and you got to get up at 2 in the morning, and your wife says to you before she goes to work at the bank as a teller, hey, don't go surfing because we need some time together in the evening. If you go surfing, you'll be dead asleep by the time I get home. How many times did I go surfing? And I was dead asleep when she came home. It made for a nice, comfortable marriage at the beginning. <laughs> She'd come on, and I'd be sunburned sitting on the couch. She'd go, you went surfing, didn't you? No, I didn't go surfing, no. <laughs> and so as we're trying to process, she, she, she looked at me one time, and we had some discussions. <laughs> and she said to me, I did not marry a donut maker. I said, I know. So my professor said, John, why don't you go back to school? And he, 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 he helped me navigate this. I said, well, I don't know. I wasn't the brightest guy in college. I, you know, I had dropped out of high school. I went to college. I had to work hard to get through it. And, and he said, well, I know some guys at this seminary in Kansas City, and they, they go semester by semester. So if you have to drop out because of money, you know, you only lose a semester. You don't lose a whole year. So I sent my transcripts and prayed about it. Lynn and I, if the Lord opens the door, we'll move to Kansas City. Uh, got accepted for the Master of Divinity to program, and I thought, okay, here we go. Loaded up our trailer, told my family, and I'll never forget the day we're leaving. My older brother comes o over, you know, just so engrossed in surfing. Nothing wrong with that. He looks at me and he goes, do you know where Kansas City is? <laughs> I, go, I go, yeah, I've looked at the map. He goes, he says, there's no surf anywhere in Kansas City. You're in the middle of the country. I go, I know. And I moved there, and God did something in me. He, he, he took something out of my life that kind of controlled me, which was surfing. And it allowed me to just focus on him, the Scripture, and my marriage. And for three years, I was in that kind of context. Now, I still surf. I have three surfboards. I love surfing. I don't go surfing that much. But it, it, it was something that God used to take, take its control over me, out, out of me. And it didn't control me the way it used to. I used to wake up in the morning when we first moved back here, Lynn and I, and I could tell you, oh, the southeast wind's blowing. Yesterday, it was three feet. It's probably about four to five feet right now. It's still going to be choppy, though. We probably need to go down to the point and surf there. Or if the wind changed directions, oh, it's offshore. we got to get to the beach now. I mean, that's the kind of way it is if you're in the... And, and you may be that way about some kind of sport or some kind of hobby. It, it, can, it can take over your life if you're not careful. And God used that time not only to mature me more in my faith, but to do some things that needed to be done. Because when I moved back here and two years later planted a church... Southeast wind would be blowing. I knew the surf was three to four feet. But you know what? I thought, no. God's called me to this. I got to be ready for Sunday. I can't just go drifting around and you know, show up sunburned and go, hey, y'all, I don't got a sermon. <laughs> so so, so I, I kind of you know, said, okay, Lord, I want to walk in you. You're, you're the Christ. You're Jesus, my Savior, and you're my Lord. So here I go. But even today, I still feel like a novice, a freshman, a beginner when it comes to knowing how he works with the heart and the soul of man. 
how he leads and guides us in different ways, how he speaks and, 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 and catches, you know, your heart in ways that you, you don't expect and does things you never dreamed of. The, the unbelievable depth and power and truth of his word. And, and to find yourself, as you look back over the years, wow, you know what? I, I think I'm getting rooted. I think I'm getting planted in him. I'm not going to go away. I'm not going to fall. I, I'm not going to find myself drifting from him because I'm, I'm, I'm going to get planted. That's what it means. It means rooted means to be planted. And when you're planted, here's what it is. It's not a surface relationship. It's not superficial. It's not shallow. For, for a tree to grow and survive and thrive and produce fruit, it has to have roots that go down and also out that touch other trees, touch other lives, become stable to bring health and life to yourself and to others. Jesus talks about it in one of his parables. He says, you know, a man went out to sow some seed and, and it fell on hard ground. And when it fell on hard ground, guess what? It could not take root. A hard heart, a heart that's unwilling to give up its own way, a heart that's unwilling to surrender and say, Lord, has a very difficult time getting rooted in a relationship because he's the Lord. He says, no, this is, this is my thing. We're doing my thing, not your thing. He threw the, threw the seed out on stony ground. It, was, it, 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 was, it took some root, but it was shallow. It didn't, didn't ever really go deep. Difficulties come and hardships and pain and struggles with people, and, and it, it just gets disheartened and it, well, it gives up. The first trial never gets rooted, never gets to grow up into what God really intended it to be. The sower throws the, the seed and it gets choked out by weeds. Cares of life, the, you know, all the distraction, all the things you want to do, and I've got to have this and I've got to have that, and you know, I've got to do this in order to look this way. All the distractions. I mean, we, we know what weeds are like. If you live around here and you have a yard, you know weeds, right? Not only weeds. <laughs> I don't know if you have this problem, but what about lizards? They're like everywhere right now. Every time I walk outside, there's like a, a lizard looking at me, four or five of them like, what are you doing here? I think, I live here. And they're like, no, we live here. We let you hang out here. <laughs> Who let the lizards out? Maybe I'm the only one with that problem, but, but weeds, they, they, they choke out, and a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, trying to grow weeds and grass at the same time. I think you can navigate that. Oh, I can, I can keep one foot in here and one foot in there. Listen to me. No, you cannot. You can't serve two masters. You can't have two lords. Reminds me of Psalm 1, where it says this, it says, But his delight's in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night, and he shall be like a tree, planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he or she does shall prosper. Salvation is the first step. It's a great step. It's a wonderful step. It's a necessary step. But then we're always growing. We're always a work in progress. And we need roots to survive. Let them go. Let them go deep. Walk in Him. And it says established. It's, and built up. Built up is an architectural word that, that you, you build on something solid, something firm. The, the, you build on Christ and you build on His Word. So that you might grow up, that you might be mature, that you might be what God intended you to be. I was in a conference this week up in Atlanta, and they had a, a group of pastors sitting up on the platform with their wives, and he asked them a bunch of questions, and he asked this one question that was kind of interesting to the wives. He said, suppose your husband died tomorrow, what would you put on his tombstone? I thought, wow. Glad I'm not up there. 
And one lady said, well, my husband's so cheap. He's sitting right next to her, and he knows he's cheap. And she said, I would put, um, I could have got this cheaper. (laughs) I thought, I hope that's not on my tombstone. You know, when, when Ruth Graham, the wife of Billy Graham, the great renowned evangelist, when she died before him, My wife and I were at the Cove, which is a conference center that the Grahams have in Asheville, North Carolina, and we were walking through it, and they have a hallway of memorabilia and pictures, and they had just put up these pictures of Ruth's funeral, and one thing that struck me as I was walking by, I thought, wow, I I didn't know this. She was very involved in the community. She She was very involved in prison ministries, and she had a inmate of a certain prison build her coffin out of plywood. That's how she was buried, in a plywood coffin. And on her tombstone, she had these words inscribed because she was apparently quite a practical joker and and just an amazing individual. And she had written on her tombstone, construction complete, thank you for your patience. I thought, boy, how true is that? We're all under construction. He's building us. He's shaping us. He's fashioning us. And we want to let him do that. Not to get sidetracked. Not to get confused about why we were saved. Not to get distracted or deceived. So important. It it says to, to, in this verse, and we're almost finished, to, to be rooted, to be built up in him, and to be established in the faith, being established has to do with maturity, has to do with His Word, it has to do with truth, His instruction, surrendering to His teaching. See, we we all need to be established. And it comes to allowing the Word to shape you and process you and correct you. Like, like it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable. Boy, you can get doctrine out of it, truth about God, and, and, and you can get reproof. You ever been reproved by God's Word? Then you're not established if you haven't. You're not getting rooted and grounded if you've never allowed the Word to, re- to be corrected by it, to be instructed by it in righteousness that the man or woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped. That's a similar word right there, established for every good work because he's got all kinds of works he wants to do in your life, and we need to be established by it. We, we come to Christ, and we're almost finished. We come to a Savior, Jesus. We recognize that He is the Lord. And we begin our journey. Awkward at first. It says, it says this, As therefore you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. It's difficult when you first start to walk, right? As a human, as a new believer. You don't know anything. Never done this before. You don't understand the Bible. You, as, a, as a little kid, I've got 11 grandkids now, and I've had the privilege of watching a lot of them learn how to walk. It's hysterical. <laughs> and I'm sure mature Christians watch me and others as they came to Christ like, <laughs> that guy, he's crazy. <laughs> but you learn how to walk, hopefully. You learn how to get rooted and built up and established to know what's real and what's phony in your own life. To, to, to submit yourself to Him. And it demonstrates itself in one powerful way, I think, and we'll close with this in verse 7. Rooted, built up, established in the faith, as you've been taught, abounding in it with this great word, I love it, with thanksgiving. 
when you've been saved, when you let yourself get rooted and grounded and, and established in the faith, you become, this is a great mark of a person who's walked with the Lord, they become a thankful person. Not a person who's always comparing themselves or always grumbling about what they don't have. But coming to a place where you know, you say, well, you know what, I found my contentment in Him. My place is there, my rooting's there, my, my grounding's there, my establishment is there. It's not anything out here, it's in Him. And I'm thankful for it. I don't want to look over here and compare myself to this person or what they have or, or what I have. No, no, no they're, they're thankful. Psalm 95, verse 1 through 3. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before His presence with a lot of grumbling and murmuring. No, with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. And Psalm 106, verse 1 says it. Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for His good and for His mercy endures forever. First Thessalonians has a very simple verse. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ for you. When you're saved, when you, when you begin to find yourself, you know, inside that door of salvation, and you're getting rooted and grounded and built up and established in faith, without a doubt, you become a thankful person. There, there was a man who lived in the 1800s, and I'll close with this little story. His name was Jonathan Oatman, Jr., born April 21st, 1856. He was from Lumberton, New Jersey. And he had a dad who was extremely gifted musically and could sing, and, and he always wanted to be like his dad. He always wanted to be able to sing and entertain, but he had no voice. He couldn't carry a tune, so he eventually gave up. And at the time of, in his mid-30s or so, he, he, he realized that he had no musical talent. But he began to write songs that other people could sing. And he wrote some hymns. You, you may never have heard this one, but it was famous in its day, and a lot of people would sing it and enjoy it. He wrote this song. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, Count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it'll surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Be thankful. Be thankful. As you're following Christ Jesus the Lord and you're rooted and grounded and built up in Him, let your life, let us as a church, be thankful people because God is worthy to be thankful for.